Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Family Teams Podcast. I'm here with uh, Cameron Akrami and Kurt Storing. Thank you guys for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Excited to talk about stuff. So we're going to hit uh, just kind of one topic, and I wanted to dive into uh, something that um, this guy Rob Henderson um, mentioned. So Rob is a kind of a, he's got a fascinating story. He's, he grew up kind of a, as a foster kid uh, and he, he um, is just a brilliant, has a brilliant mind and has been writing uh, uh, really from the perspective of the working class about a lot of issues and probably his claim to fame uh, more than anything else is really coining and describing the impact of what he calls the luxury beliefs uh, on on society. So luxury belief is something that somebody, a belief that gives you status, but that you can only really live out or hold if you are in a position of economic privilege. <laughs> so uh, there's lots of examples he gives. He lists tons of them. Things like, you know, defund the police, you know, <laughs> like that works great if you live in a gated community, you know, not so good if you live in a really crime ridden area. Um, so you can say that all day long because you're not incurring any of the costs, but you are getting status <laughs> by saying that within a certain community. Another one is a lot of positions that were related to climate change. I mean, it's really easy to talk about, you know, hey, we're going to, uh, we should all pay more for energy. <laughs> That's great if you're not in a you know, impoverished country, <laughs> you know? Um, so this is not being called out properly, that there are beliefs that give you a lot of status, but they also, you're not incurring the cost. You're actually exporting the cost on vulnerable people. Um, and and so, and what, what's really interesting to me about Rob Henderson's position is he's really begun to talk about this from the perspective of the family. As a kid who grew up, you know, in a, in a single parent household and then ended up in foster care, uh, he's very concerned about about popular beliefs that are really hard on the family. I mean, he talks a lot about you know any kinds of beliefs like we should have alternative lifestyles. We don't really need nuclear. The nuclear moms and dads aren't important. He's like, yeah, that that works really good if you are in a position of the top you know one percent of privilege. Then maybe you can make that work. You have all you use all this money and all this privilege and your your huge network to be able to defend your, you know, your, uh, alternative lifestyle, but for somebody who's barely surviving, um, to say being a single parent is just as good as being in a two parent home. That is a terrible idea for 90% of the world. Um, and they're not getting status from your belief, but your policies that are creating the situation potentially for more people that can't incur the cost. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, he's, he's really stirring up that conversation. And, uh, he was on a podcast called unheard where he was describing one of these situations with regards to technology that really uh, stood out to me. So I'm going to play this uh, little clip for you guys, and then we'll love to get your, your feedback. There was a, an op-ed in the New York Times written a little over a year ago, and the headline was something like, you know, I make video games, but I won't let my daughters play them. And he, like, very, he was very honest. I mean, it was a very uh, blunt op-ed where he was like, we want you to be addicted to the games because, like, that's how we make money. <laughs> like, it's not that hard to understand to, to connect the dots. But then he's like, you know, talking about how he's he's worried that his you know his daughters would would get addicted to it, and so he doesn't let them play. But I cited this uh, this study uh, recently, indicating that um, children raised in families that earn thirty five thousand dollars or less per year spend two hours more per day on screens than children raised in families that earn a hundred thousand dollars or more per year. So essentially, kids in poor families spend two hours more per day in front of a screen than kids from rich families. And you know, a lot of that has to do, I think, you know, interestingly, that is connected to the, the family issue, where if you are a single parent and you work all day and your attention and resources are spread very thin, and then you get home and your kid is disruptive or rowdy or something, it's just so much easier to just give them an iPhone or an iPad and just say, hey, go chill out, and they can be distracted and kind of, um, you know, soothed for a while while you can, you know, kind of have mm -hmm. some peace and quiet. But if you have two parents, you know, you can you can actually monitor a disruptive kid and find more constructive and engaging ways to, to take up their time. All right. So that, that's his position. And I wanted to maybe get your, your guys' feedback on this. So I think, I think one of the problems that I'm really wrestling with here 
is that when we talk to family teams, we're often talking to, you know, intact families and we're trying to help level up families that where there's a mom and a dad, but what's, you know, the vast majority of people are living in a world with broken families where they don't have a lot of those advantages. And so part of what I don't know what to do with, and I want to get your guys' take, I just want to have a discussion about this. So I, I really don't know how to think about this. So the is um, regulating technology a family problem or a societal problem? That's the question I'm trying to wrestle with. I definitely prefer to think of it as a family problem in my context because I have the bandwidth to enforce on my family um, the the kinds of sort of technology restrictions that my family will will help my family to thrive. But it requires enormous amounts of work. I mean, I have contracts with my kids and, you know, I monitor the devices and I'm, I'm locking them down. And and so we're in a position of just radical privilege, so to speak, from a, just um, a bandwidth perspective. We, we care a lot about this issue. We've thought a lot about it. We've read the books. We've, you know, read the articles and we're intentional about how to limit our children's um, the impact that social media is having my daughters, for example, or that the, and, and I would say that even in that context, there's a lot of times in which we've really failed our kids. I mean, there's, there's a whole world of, of challenges. I think our families faced and we just were too slow or too ignorant or too passive <laughs> to fight this monster. Uh, and, and so I definitely don't want to paint the picture that we've done everything right. Like we're constantly learning and we've made a lot of mistakes as well. Okay. But that's, that's one frame. There's another frame that Rob Henderson is bringing up that I don't think about nearly enough. And this is the one I wanted to ask you guys about. What about, what about everyone else? I mean, you've got companies that are spending billions of dollars to get children addicted to, to things that are going to grab their attention and make these different platforms, a huge amount of money. And wow, that is not a, is, that's not a fair fight. I mean, I don't feel like it's a fair fight in my context. And so I don't know what to do about this, but this is kind of the, I want to stir up this conversation and say, you know, as fathers, do we have two obligations? Do we have an obligation on one hand to be leading our families to make sure that we have policies in place within our households that are protecting our children from this vulnerability? But do we also have the obligation to think about this at a societal level, given the fact the vast majority of children are being exposed to the, these sort of predatory technologies in a way where the, the parents or the single parent in whichever case, you know, they, they just don't have the bandwidth to really properly monitor what's going on. And, and so these kids are getting addicted in ways that are destroying all of us, right. And destroying another generation of children. Yeah. What, what do you, what does that start for you guys? I'll start with you, Cameron, and then go to you, Kurt. Yeah. As I'm hearing that I'm imagining people that I know people who even do have the bandwidth and yet are just kind of tossing, tossing screens in front of their kids. And it almost sounds like the same thing as junk food. Yeah. You know, it's just difficult to find. The, these are people who have the bandwidth. So I think in their case, it is kind of a choice, but I see similar decisions being made in those families that, that don't have the means and really don't seem like, feel like they have much of a choice. And I guess what I'm just kind of wrestling with as I hear this is the idea that there's kind of a story that is being believed and lived um, where you don't, you don't almost have a compelling enough vision outside of that. And so what we see at the end of some, like a lived story are families with means and families without means. But are, is that because there's like an underlying set of beliefs that have led them into those places where somebody who has means is also stewarding other things in their life in a way that is maybe more responsible. And, and maybe that's the, a, just another facet of that. So that's kind of what that's stirring up for me a little bit is wondering, is, are we looking at one? Is it, are we kind of a little too narrow and looking at just the screens or is this kind of a whole bag of decision-making and beliefs that lead somebody into a position where they find right. themselves with that relying on that? Excellent point. That basically um, one of the principles that I, the way I would kind of describe what you're describing Cameron is look, Children were meant to be raised in very strong families with, with two parents and any band-aids you put or anything society does to try to mitigate the damage created by not deciding to follow the kinds of beliefs and the kinds of practices that lead to that is just sort of 
you know, delaying the inevitable catastrophe. Like the catastrophe's already happened. The catastrophe is that that child needed a father and a mother that were very actively engaged. And so we can zero in on this one problem. Oh my gosh, they're they're living at the mercy of technology platforms, but they're living on the mercy of a thousand other horrible things like the fast food industry, <laughs> you know, like, you know, who knows what's going on in the school systems, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's just, yeah, it's a, the, the, the catastrophe happened um, much earlier and the, the root of the problem is, is a little bit further back. So yeah, Kurt, what does that, what does that start for you? Any additional things you'd add to that or, or how would you, how do you think about this problem? Need a blueprint to revise your family to be a multi-generational team on mission? The book Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor is the book that summarizes all the big picture ideas you hear on this podcast. Available on Amazon or familyteams.com. Yeah, for me, I have to ask, is this so unique that it requires a new solution? Because typically anything where you're asking about a societal constraint, I'm asking who's putting that constraint on me and what are they going to do next? And right. so just for me, my own belief system is like, yeah, let's not do that. And so what do you do? For me, yeah. yes, I agree that as others, um, we have to be the ones guarding this. I think this is a maybe not unique, but a very specific worry that I've got for my kids because it is so um, overwhelming. Like there's just no getting yeah. away. And like, like, um, you know, the, the clip said it's, it's specifically designed to take attention away. And I think there's an epidemic of distraction lately, um, or perhaps over the last number of decades, um, that I think stops people from thinking deeper about the purpose of life, uh, the things that matter. And so I think there's a huge like existential component to this, that if we just try to regulate this from like, let's say a federal level or something like that, um, I think like you just said, that band-aid uh, analogy is perfect because it's so much bigger. And yet, if we do nothing, are we willing to pay the consequences of like, I don't know, 95% of the population not pulling their head out of the matrix in time? So that's where I go like, yeah. I'm good with me. I'm trying to tell everyone I know, uh, and I don't let my kids do very much on screens for this specific reason, but can I do anything about the guy down the street who I know plays video games for eight hours a day? I don't know, because that, that just gets into like government oversight that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a problem in which this, the pro, the the disease is so terrible, but it's possible the cure would be even worse. And it was interesting, like when we were, April and I were just in Spain and, you know, they were lamenting. Um, we had a, a tour guide who was discreet, you know, and every single one of our tour guides were divorced and single parents. It was, that, that was, I don't know why that, that, that was the case, but that, that was the case. That was, um, you know, a very small sample size, but they, but because of this, we were, and we were there, part of the reason why April and I like, we like to travel to new country and ask a million questions about family. Um, when we're there. So it's been a week in Spain, just, you know, trying to understand family culture. And there was fast, there's a lot of fascinating things, a lot of really cool things that we learned. But I think one of the challenges and one of the things that we, we saw that was universal and was really articulated well by um, one of our, one of our tour guides, when we were asking her about her family and she was talking about COVID and how it was so hard on the kids. And she said it was so bad because the government was unable to protect the children. And, and, you know, if, you know, it's like, we, we need, you know, and they're, they've, I think they outlawed homeschool for the same reason. Like we, we have to make sure the government gets between parents and children because we can't trust parents with children. I mean, who knows what will happen <laughs> if, if, if you, if the government can't protect children from their parents and we all know there's horror stories, right. Of, of, you know, this is kind of Rob Henderson's whole story, which is why I find his opinion so fascinating because he's constantly dealing with this tension. Um, cause he's, he's very much in this boat where he saw what happened when he was exposed, uh, to horrible things as a child and neglectful parenting. Um, yet he's also equally, if not more alarmed and concerned about the other problems that the cure could be worse than the disease. And this, this is such an intractable problem and every society is attempting to deal with this in different ways. And, and this is, but I think that what, I think that the problem that, and the thing that I want to like sort of signal is that the diseases are getting worse. And I think that what's going to, I think that people are going to begin to demand the, as the diseases get worse, it's going to be increasingly attractive for people to call for the government to step in 
between parents and children and say, we have to regulate all of this and be like China, which literally regulates how much time your kids can spend on a computer. Because we're going to get overrun by the countries who do have universal um, standards around these topics because they, they we can't defend these children. So, I mean, this is such an intractable problem that I'm like constantly trying to understand. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron, what are your thoughts? When I hear that, it, it seems like the fundamental problem is the family and the decision-making and kind of the whole ethos and worldview that's there. And because that is rotted out and the walls are falling down, it's like there's there's nobody, I don't want to say nobody, few people talking about uh, the core problem and trying to strengthen that so that upcoming generations can build that foundation in. And instead, they're just shoring up the walls to try to keep the walls from collapsing. But that's such a crummy yeah. solution. And I think yes. that I think that one issue is that like there it has to do with the, how loud some of these voices are. There are very loud voices in marketing that are screaming all day long that you need to sign up for this, you need to buy more, you need to take, you know, take in this, consume this media. And then you've got the other side who's the in hysterics over this, you know, the legitimate problem that's there. But I think they're misdiagnosing, you know, this the solution is you set a band-aid and but I think it has to do with like the 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 cultural kind of norm and the cultural story that's there. How do you shift and shape that? Right. Yeah. And I think that's kind of Very one different. of the harder problems because how do you get somebody to believe something different? Because yeah. that's the issue is you're you're letting your kid you're thinking it's okay to put him in front of a screen because you believe that that's better than them running around and being a little bit crazy or whatever the right. deal is. Yeah, this is the reason why you guys. I'm such a I'm such a hawk watching the way the culture describes something like fatherhood, right? So, you know, so many people that I know have been sort of obsessed with Bluey, you know, as a TV show that kind of describes a certain version of fatherhood, the the playful father. And, you know, my critique of, on that has always been, there's nothing wrong with being a playful father. I think that's a really critical part of fatherhood. But I think that one of the things that a show does when it starts to enter a symbolic world is it, it really starts to articulate the vision for the whole overarching idea. And it's difficult to imagine the kind of really rule setting father, you know, the, 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 you know, when you're constantly casting the father in this very particular, um, this particular role. And, and what we need is imagine a show that really demonstrated that, wow, once you have a father in a family, all of a sudden there's, there's someone who's constantly thinking about the vision and part of what you're describing Cameron is fathers get to play offense and not just defense. Like we're actually leading our children into a great vision and a great mission. And so part of the reason why we're saying no to things is because there's a giant yes, that we're leading our family towards. Well, that requires a lot of leadership that requires a certain kind of philosophy of family that the family is like a team. And so when you start to have those beliefs, you start to imagine that a, a family led by a father, a visionary father like that is going to have such, such a different, um, culture. And that's going to lead to a very different kind of experience for children and, and for moms and dads. And no one's really articulating that well at a cultural, culturally attractive level. And when we are describing that, oftentimes we're, you know, t subtly taking pot shots at this. An another way I'm cur curious your thoughts about. So Jonathan Haidt has been going around um, really describing these four rules that he wished that, that would, that all families or all schools would would adopt that would really protect particularly daughters from social media. One of those rules is that he wants parents to um, decide voluntarily to not allow children to have social media until they're 16 years old. And he's called it a collective collective action problem, which is to say that he wants parents to go to other parents and try to get them to also uh, not allow this for their children. Um, and that if we, because part of the problem is that kids actually don't want to be on social media. They just feel like they have to get all the friends are on social media. So we have to solve the problem as a collective. Um, and what I immediately thought of was Rob Henderson's <laughs> situation, which is that works great for the 10% of impact intact families where you can actually talk to the, to, to a, to an active mother or father who's thinking about these things and willing to stand up to their daughter and, and, and actually enforce you know, and monitor what's going on, you know, that's, that's not where most families are at. And so the collective action problem is not going to work because there's not enough intact families to have a collective action at all. You really have to say that you really have to put steel in the spine 
of moms and dads to say it's your responsibility, regardless of what anyone else does, regardless of what other families do. You have to make these decisions and set these policies as a as a household. That is your job. And we've stolen that somehow. And I think we are beginning to subtly suggest, and this is why I'm trying to trying to tease this out, that this isn't even our problem. This is really a government level problem. And man, that's your problem. Yeah, what you're saying, Kurt, that you're gonna create a a disease that's worse than the cure once you start unleashing that beast on on families. The Family Plan Calendar is the new way to keep your family team organized. Plan your rhythms, menu, household chores, and notes for the family all in one place. Visit FamilyTeams.com to purchase. Yeah, and, and I think that this is so big that I personally, I need to break it up. Like you've got the very specific problem of fathers leading families. And even in that, in our circle, so to speak, guys who should get it, I'm still surprised that it's not a hundred percent like, oh yeah, we don't have screens at all. Like, what do you mean we have iPads at the restaurant? Like, no, of course not. And I'm surprised that guys who have everything else that I think, you know, a good father has, and they're like still oblivious to this. And so the, the issue doesn't seem to have seeped even into the most, I don't even know what you want to say it, aware fatherhood circles. And that's a huge problem in itself. And so what do we do about that? Well, seems like you're doing that with this podcast with family teams in general. I was doing that with dad work. I was trying to be the example of, hey guys, our generation missed out on wisdom. And that's what I get from you personally. Like I see you as going like, hey, there's actually this whole vein of wisdom that we've just missed. And I was like, oh, can you please just keep talking, Jeremy? Because like, I didn't even know that. And so I'm seeing this and we almost have to get more of that, more real life uh, examples of why and how fatherhood can be amazing if you put in the hard work of creating boundaries. And if you actually go through the actual steps of leading your family, like you would lead your business, for example. But on the other side of that is this societal issue where all of these kids are being missed because they have the single family households, because their parents probably missed that wisdom that I'm talking about. And so when you start going back to the first order problems, it becomes so big that I have to ask the meta question of, what is my responsibility here? Can I or should I be trying to get government to do something because, wow, look at all these kids, or do I just go out in my pocket and the single mothers that I know, do I say, hey, can I hang out with your son for like an hour? And we'll just go play at the park or something with my kids. Is that the best I can do? Or is it so big that I got to do more? I, like, I have no idea. Yeah. I, I don't, I would love to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, man. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, part of the way I think about this problem is you have to have a hospital and you have to have sort of an army going at the same time. Like you have to play offense and defense. You have to deal with the problems that, that, that have created. And if you just, just have a hospital, um, imagine, you know, you have a invading force and you're like, well, we're really good. Like oh, we're all doing hospitals. And so as people are getting blown up left and right, we're so good at healing them. And so, you know, it's like, you also have to like put people on, you know, in the, you got to build the castles. You got to like, you got to, you got to raise up the armies. You got to play offense and defense. And I think that sometimes, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can do either. I have to, I have to serve and love that single um, mother and the the real situation she's in and the the kind of damage that's been created uh, by who, wh however that happened. And then also, we also have to like be pushing forward, right? Pushing, pushing forward into what does God really design family to be, um, and how do we maximize our our households um, and their uh, their their flourishing and their impact. Go ahead, Cameron. Yeah, it's just kind of two things really to touch also on what Kurt was saying. One, I'm the same guy. My circumstances haven't changed much. They hadn't anyway, except for I adopted a new story and a new vision and everything changed. Yeah. In other words, I'm the same person and yet everything about my family, everything about the things that I devote my time and energy to, any... All of that stuff, There's, I can't even think hardly of one area of life that hasn't shifted for me over the last couple of years. And so if I'm the same person and it's just taking a different set of actions over time, then I believe that it's possible for anybody. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of hope in that. So I don't want to just say, well, it's, yes. it's just a disaster. That said, my family is still intact. I'm not just picking up the pieces of something that I exploded with a hand grenade. So that is a real, a real thing. So I like the idea. One, I think we just need to call... This, these alternative modes and methods for what they are, and that's entirely destructive. And all that we're talking about and the reasons why 
like the foster care system is an example of wreckage, you know, and where, you know, that we're tied in with the foster care system, all of these things that are, that are even causing the, this discussion with the, uh, the clip that you played are because of just wreckage and broken things. And so if we're not willing to call those things and the things that lead to that kind of wreckage out for what it is, then I think we just perpetuate the same kind of problems. So one, I think call it for what it is, but also there is hope if somebody's willing to embrace and take some different steps, even with a little bit that they might have, I think. I've got a lot of hope that it doesn't take a lot. It takes intensity, but I think it doesn't take a lot of means necessarily to make some big moves. Yeah, I agree 100%. So I, I do think we, we got to think about this as a generational issue. We got to get as many families to begin to think this way properly, that what they're raising up is, is particularly, and I think often it starts with getting the father, getting the father to understand what their role is and what a family really is, that they get to build a multi-generational household, a multi-generational team on a mission. And for them to get excited about that and then to begin to move their family properly, that creates enormous, like, I love how you put it, Cameron, that it once your mindset shifts, it changes everything. And that's what I've discovered increasingly is that that, that is the root of the problem. And so it's not, a, it's not an awareness problem, first and foremost. It's not a policy problem. It's not a technology problem. It's, it's a problem in the way that we see family and fatherhood. And that's why I like, I like to get really minuscule. I know people are like, I just got another person online today who was like coming after me or, you know, can't believe I would critique something like blue or whatever. I, I definitely see that as the, as the core of the problem. Like we have to have a conversation about the nature of fatherhood because once a father gets a vision for what fatherhood really is, something comes online that changes everything. And uh, all of a sudden solutions that you couldn't imagine start to occur to them. And, uh, and they start believing their family in a better direction. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this with me today. This has been an uh, awesome kind of quick break from the day and like dive into a super deep topic. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Perfect. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.